Heavenly Father, thank you for tonight, dear God. I thank you for your house and your word, Lord. And I ask that you please meet with us tonight. Be with Brother Baker, Lord. Fill him with the Spirit, Lord. Give him boldness and clarity, God. Be with each one of us, God. Give us a tender heart to your word and help us apply the message to our life, God. We love you and we thank you for everything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Again, I'm very thankful to be here. I'm very honored to be able to stand behind this pulpit and preach. I'm very thankful for the, uh, the introduction that I was given. I'm just glad that my wife was in here to hear that. And also, you know, uh, um, when Pastor Jimenez sent me that text, you know, I was really, I was really thankful to be able to preach at, at Verity, Vancouver. But I was extremely excited to come here as well. And uh, I know how Pastor Jimenez alliterates all of his sermons. And I've only done this one other time. And I wanted to impress him. And I wanted to make sure I get invited back. So I made sure I alliterated this sermon. So hopefully he likes it. Now look there in chapter 12, Matthew chapter number 12. We're going to begin reading in verse number 39. Verse number 39, the Bible reads, But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And specifically, I want to home in there at the very end of verse number 39, the phrase, the sign of the prophet Jonas. Now, Jonas there, of course, is referring to Old Testament Jonah. When it's translated from Hebrew to English, we have Jonah. That's what we really know know him as. That's if we were going to just, in casual conversation, talk about the story, we would refer to him as Jonah. We see it in the New Testament, it, it, it shows up as Jonas, as Jonas. And we, this is a pretty common passage that's used, maybe sometimes out soul winning, or maybe just in conversation with other people as well. It's a really good passage to prove that Jesus Christ was in hell for three days and three nights. A really good passage for that. There's a lot of other clear, clear passages. But one really interesting thing about this is that it shows that Jonah in the Old Testament was a symbol where he was a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to have you turn to Luke chapter number 24, just a couple of books over. You're in Matthew, then Mark, Luke chapter number 24. And we're going to look in verse number 25. So the context here is... Uh, This is after Jesus Christ's resurrection. This is the last chapter of Luke. After Jesus Christ's resurrection, there's two men that are walking on the road to Emmaus. And uh, it gives you one of their names, Cleopas. It doesn't give you the other man's name. And Jesus Christ appears to them. The Bible tells you that their eyes are withholding at this time. So they don't know that it's Jesus. And they're talking, and and, and they're, they're lacking faith at this moment. And then Jesus Christ... He uh, he begins speaking here in verse number 25. It tells you, it says, Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And I want you to focus here verse 27. Notice what he says, or the Bible says, And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded or he explained, he pointed out things from the Old Testament. He expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So notice what it says in beginning at Moses and all the prophets. He expounded unto unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning themselves. So there isn't a single book of the Bible, and it doesn't matter what book you would choose. If you chose, you know, Obadiah, the smallest book in the Old Testament, the Bible teaches that Jesus, at this time, he was able to expound unto them things concerning himself. In the Old Testament, the whole Old Testament, there's something in Scripture pointing towards Jesus Christ, pointing towards the life of Jesus Christ, pointing towards the cross, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And one of the most famous Bible stories in the whole Bible is the book of Jonah, Jonah and the whale. If any child grew up you know, in church, that's a, that's a story that he's very familiar with. That's a story that maybe she's very familiar with. If I were to pick you know, some of the top five Bible stories that are very popular, I would probably say you know, Noah and the flood, right? Maybe Adam and Eve, Daniel and the den of lions. I would also for sure include in that Jonah and the whale. Now, the thing about that story is most of the time, if you were to ask your average Christian what they knew about that story, what they knew about Jonah and about the life of Jonah and about the book of Jonah, most of them, of the Christians, would only be able to tell you one thing, and that's that he's in the whale. That's pretty much all that they would be able to tell you. Maybe some could say, hey, well, he was disobedient to God. He was given a message, and because of his disobedience, that's why he ended up in the whale. Maybe some could tell you that. 
But I personally believe when reading the book of Jonah that the most interesting part of the book of Jonah is not while Jonah is in the whale. I believe that the most interesting part of the book of Jonah is before Jonah was swallowed by the whale. And the title of my sermon this morning is The Sign of the Prophet Jonah. And I'm going to be going through, we're going to look at the earlier part of Jonah's life. Before Jonah was swallowed by the whale... And we're going to be, and I'm going to preach through there chapter number one in the book of Jonah. I'll have you turn there, Jonah chapter number one. The book of Jonah, it's in the Minor Prophets. Jonah chapter number one. I'm also going to read to you from one other passage here. 2 Kings chapter number 14, verse number 25. 2 Kings chapter number 14, verse number 25. The Bible says, He restored the coast of Israel from the entering of Hamath unto the sea of the plain, according to the word of the Lord God of Israel, which he spake by the hand of his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, which was of geth Jonah chapter number 1. Now, I read that to you just because, you know, it's good to just know the Bible. It's good to just have education of the Bible. And that's the only time in the Old Testament other than the book of Jonah where Jonah is mentioned. And it's, it's, clear, that it's clear it's the same person you see in, in Jonah chapter number one, verse number one, that he's the son of Amittai. You see that here also. And he's also referred to as the prophet. Seven times in the New Testament, Jonah of the story of Jonah, of the book of Jonah, is, is mentioned. As I said, in the other form, it shows up as the name Jonas. There's another man named Jonas who's, who's spoken of a couple other times, but seven times in the New Testament. Now, right here, we're going to begin reading in Jonah chapter number 1, verse number 1. The Bible says, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish, from the presence of the Lord, and went down to Joppa. And he found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare thereof, and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish, from the presence of the Lord. Now notice there in verse number 2, you see the command that's given to Jonah. That's, that's how the, the, the book of Jonah actually starts out. It's God speaking, and he says, Arise, Go to Nineveh, and he tells you why. That great city, he says, because the city is a wicked city. He says, their wickedness is come up before me. So he's given a command, and from the very beginning, we can see that Jonah was disobedient. Something that's interesting about this passage, in verse number 1 there, it says, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah. But then if you look in verse number 3 at the very end, it says that he fled from the presence of the Lord. So you see the word of the Lord coming to him. And what's he really fleeing from? He's fleeing from the word of God. He's fleeing, fleeing from that commandment. And we know that the Bible teaches that Jesus Christ is the word, that God is the word. Right there we see also one other thing I want to point out about specifically about, his diso about uh, the commandment that was given to him. Here in chapter number 1, verse number 1, when it says, Arise, go to men of that great city, it says, And cry against it. What does it mean to cry? It means to yell, right? And this in, in, in the New Testament, when actually when Jonah is obedient and he goes, we know that from the book of Jonah, and it refers back to when Jonah was there, it says that Nineveh repent, repented, right, of the preaching because of the preaching of Jonah. So when Jonah went there and he was crying against that city, do you know what he was doing? He was preaching. And those two words in the Bible are synonymous, crying and preaching. The commandment is given right here where he tells him to go cry against that city. That command is given again later in chapter number 3. And do you know what he tells him that time? To preach the preaching that I bid thee. So that time he substitutes those words again. We see him tell him to cry. And we see there he tells him in the second, the second time he gives the command that he tells him to preach. And notice it's not a positive message. He's going there to preach against that city. It's because of the wickedness of that city. He's going there to warn that city. And the message that he brings is yet 40 days and Nineveh is going to be overthrown. Forty days and Nineveh is going to be overthrown. You know what's very interesting about Jonah and about the decision that he made to be disobedient here? Is that later on, Jonah's having, having a conversation with God. And Jonah says that he knew, that Jonah knew that if he went there and he preached you know, God's word and they repented, that God would spare them. You know, Jonah chose to not go anyways. Jonah said he wasn't going to go. And that's my first point is the disobedience of Jonah and how selfish Jonah had to be to know. The Bible tells you there was 120,000 people in that city. And he knew if I go there and I preach God's word, 
I preach God's word and they do repent that I know that God would spare them. How selfish did Jonah have to be? To be disobedient to God's command, knowing that these people had the opportunity to be spared. I want you to grasp that idea in your mind. And you know, there's a lot of, a lot of people, a lot of churches that are filled with a bunch of Jonas today. There's commands that are given throughout the Bible to prophets, just like Jonah, but there's also commands that are given to latter-day Christians. And that's, go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And these churches are filled with pastors and Christians that are in the same state that Jonah was in. You know what that is? A state of disobedience. And you know the reason why Jonah didn't go? Because he was selfish. Do you know the reason why all these Christians and all these churches aren't going out and they're not preaching the gospel? Is because they're selfish. They don't care whether Nineveh is destroyed. They don't care whether their city goes to hell. They don't care. You know, the, the churches that are in all the major cities of California, Los Angeles, San Diego, you know, God doesn't want these cities to be destroyed. God wants to spare them. You know, you have San Francisco. Maybe God does want that one to be destroyed. I don't know. But you have all these cities all across California, right? God wants to spare them. God's long-suffering. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But you know what? You have the pastors, you have all of these Christians that are just sitting around and they're disobedient. Why are they disobedient? Because they're selfish. That's why. They're disobedient because they're selfish. And you know it's funny that in this area, if you'd say in Sacramento, you know, all of the, all of the people, all of the pastors, all of the churches that came out against Verity Baptist Church when all of that went on and came out against Pastor Jimenez, it's funny that these people that stood on the side of the Sodomites, or they stood on the side of the world, what's the reason? Because we're loving, they'll say, and you're not. These are the same Christians that aren't going soul winning. The exact same Christians. Now, you can tell me that you love people until you're stinking blue in the face. If you never go soul winning, I don't believe you. I don't care what you say. And you can tell me over and over and over again. If you're just going to sit on your lazy butt and not go out soul winning weekly, not, go, not show up to church when the church is meeting, I don't believe you. I don't, you, know, you know how to tell whether somebody loves people? You know how to tell whether somebody cares that there's souls that are dying and going to hell? That they're doing something about it. That they're actually going out and they're preaching to Nineveh. They're preaching, you know, that which God has bidded us to preach. God bade us to preach. They're going out and they're preaching God's word. Not only Jonah's disobedience, keep looking there in Jonah chapter number 1. We'll start reading again. Verse number 4, it says, But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship and he lay and was fast asleep. Now, first thing I want to point out is notice that this storm was not just a storm that just arose you know, of nature just because of science. The Bible says... There in verse number four, it says, but the Lord sent out a great wind. It says the Lord sent out a great wind. You know what that, you know what that tells me is that if you're going to blatantly be disobedient with God, you're not just going to get away with it. If you're a Christian, you're a saved Christian, and you choose to be, be disobedient to God's commands, you choose, like in context here, not to preach God's word. You pr choose not to be obedient to the statutes and the laws of God. And you may think, hey, you know... I, God's commands are just so restrictive. God's commands just depress me and they hold me back and I can't have any fun. God's going to make sure you don't have fun. God will send great storms in your life if you want to be disobedient to his commands. God will send problems and trouble in your life if you want to be disobedient to God's commands. Another thing I want to point out about this, again, Jonah's selfishness in verse number 5. So you have, it says, Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God. So are these Christians... These aren't saved people. And look where Jonah is. And cast forth the, wear, the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. Watch this. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. These are clearly the mariners, the, people, the, 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 the fishermen, the people that are on the, on the ship. They're clearly unsaved. And Jonah doesn't care at all. Jonah's just trying to do his own thing. Jonah just wants to go on a vacation you know, to Tarshish. That's all he's worried about. And there's unsaved people. So even, even though he was disobedient to his specific mission that he was given, he could have at least went and gave the gospel to these men. But he didn't care 
because he was selfish. The second thing I want to point out is Jonah's depression. Something people do oftentimes when they're depressed is they sleep, and they can sleep through anything. The reason why I say that, if you turn over to Jonah chapter number 4, look at verse number 3. Jonah chapter number 4, verse number 3. <clears throat> Jonah speaking to God. He says, Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee. That's like saying, I beg you. I beseech thee my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. A person that doesn't want to live anymore is not a happy person. That's a sad person. That's a depressed person. And, and just to prove that he's not just saying this to God and he doesn't mean it, look at verse number 8. It says, And it came to pass when the sun did arise that God prepared a vehement east wind and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted and wished in himself to die and said, It is better for me to die than to live. Jonah wants to die. Do you know what type of person, you know, you know what type of person ends up committing suicide or wishes that they would die? A depressed person. Do you know what types of people are depressed? Selfish people. Those are the types of people that live depressed lives. You know who sleeps all the time? Depressed people. You know what's very interesting is this phrase right here is only found sim a similar phrase one other time. And it's in 1 Kings chapter number 19 with Elijah. And he says that he requested, is the way that it's worded, he requested in himself that he would die. Do you know what Elijah's doing? He's sleeping. Do you know what he does? He's sleeping, and then he wakes up and he eats, and you know what he does after that? He goes back to sleep. That's because he was depressed. And do you know why he's depressed? You know why Jonah specifically was depressed? Because he was a disobedient Christian, that's why. Because he was a dis. And here's the thing, people think like, hey, you know, I just want to do this. This is what I want. These are things that will make me happy. God knows what will make you happy. God laid out his laws. God laid out his commands. And that's what will make you happy. You think that will make you happy. What will end up happening is you'll have pleasure for, for a, you know, just for a season. There's pleasure in sin for a season. And then you'll end up being depressed, and then God will send a storm in your life, and you'll end up destroying your life. That's what will happen. You'll end up destroying your own life through your own disobedience. God knows what will make you happy. You know the most happy people that are in our movement, that are in our churches, that are in any independent Baptist churches, are the people that live obedient lives to God's Word. Do you know those people that are the most, the most unhappy? Disobedient Christians. They live the most miserable life of anyone I've ever met. You know why? Because they're just being afflicted constantly by God. They're having storms in their lives just constantly by God. You can look at a pattern of their life just destroying their life repeatedly. Just repeated disobedience. Go back to Jonah chapter number, chapter number 1. Jonah chapter number 1. We're going to begin reading again verse number 4. It said there, But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship and he lay and was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God, if so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. Now keep your hand here and let's go over to Mark chapter number 4. The second book in the New Testament, <clears throat> within the Gospels there, Mark chapter number 4. <clears throat> Mark chapter number 4, and we'll begin reading in verse number 36. Mark chapter number 4. The end of the chapter there, verse number 36, the Bible reads, And when they had sent away the multitude, referring to the disciples, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships, and there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, referring to the bottom of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? So we can see great symbolism here between the story of Jonah where we were reading. You know, a great storm comes about. There's a great storm in the book of Jonah, right? And where's Jonah? Jonah's down in the, it says that he's down in the bottom of the ship, he's down in the sides of the ship. He's in the hinder part of the ship. And then we see Jesus Christ here, and Jesus is doing the same thing. Jesus is sleeping. Jesus is sleeping not because he's depressed. Jesus is sleeping because he's a very hard worker. They asked him, you know, his disciples were asking him, are you crazy? You just keep working. So he, he got a perfect opportunity. You know, it's nice to sleep when it's raining outside, so he went down there and he's sleeping. But you can see the symbolism here between Jonah and Jesus Christ in this story. Very, very strong symbolism. Go back to Jonah chapter number 1. 
Jonah chapter number one. And, and you know what's interesting as well is that the language is the same. You have the ship master, right, that, that comes down to wake up Jonah. Then you have the disciples that come down and they refer to him specifically as master. Not only that, Jonah was on a ship with the fishermen, right? These were experienced fishermen. You know who Jesus was on the ship with? His disciples, who were obviously fishers of men, but they were also literal fishermen. You have Simon Peter, you have, you have Andrew, his brother, you have James and John, and they were, in, they were in a partnership together. So you have a very strong symbolism, a lot of figurative, uh, you know, a lot of pictures there with Jesus and Jonah. So I'm again reading there again in verse number 7. Look at verse number 7 in Jonah chapter number 1. It says, And they said, Everyone to his fellow, Come, and let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and then it says this, and the lot fell upon Jonah. Now, ever since the first time I read my Bible, the very first time I remember thinking when I read that passage, and I still believe this strongly to this day, that there was no coincidence that that lot just fell on Jonah. I strongly believe that God caused that lot, that lot specifically to fall upon Jonah. Now, I want you to turn to Leviticus chapter number 16 here. Leviticus chapter number 16, the third book in the Bible, Leviticus chapter number 16. <clears throat> Leviticus chapter number 16, I want you to look in, uh, in verse number 3. Leviticus chapter number 16, verse number 3. The Bible says, Thus shall Aaron come into the holy place with a young bullock for a sin offering, and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on the holy linen coat, and he shall have the linen breeches upon his flesh, and, and shall be girded with a linen girdle, and with a linen miter shall he be attired. These are holy garments. Therefore shall he wash his flesh in water, and so put them on. And he shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats for a sin offering, and one ram for a burnt offering. And Aaron shall offer his bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make an atonement for himself, and for, and for his house. And he shall take the two goats. Now start paying attention here if you weren't before. And he shall take the two goats... And present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the, the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. So this is interesting. So they have the priest, right? And you have the two goats that are brought before him. One of them is going to be the sacrifice that's going to atone for their sins, right? Well, that's going to be the sacrifice. It's obviously all pictures Jesus Christ. Now you have the priest, you have the two goats that are, that are brought, and he says that there's going to be lots that are cast. However this was done with dice or some other object, however this, this worked, they would cast the lots and when a lot would fall upon, the, they would cast a lot, and one they considered the Lord's lot. And that lot was going to be, if it fell on that, uh, that, a specific goat, the goat that that lot fell on was going to be the goat that was to be sacrificed, that was to be the offering. That was considered the Lord's lot. Then you had the other goat, which was considered the scapegoat. And they were going to take the scapegoat, and they were just going to let the scapegoat free. Now, I've never met an independent Baptist or, or anyone that knows their Bible at all that doesn't know or understand that this represents Jesus Christ and Barabbas. And you have a very similar situation. You have the priest, you have Pilate, and then you have the scapegoat that's brought, right, which is Barabbas. And then you have Jesus Christ, which is brought, which is the one that's for the sin offering, which is the one that's going to be offered up. And you have the Lord's lot that fell upon Jesus Christ. He ended up being taken and he was sacrificed, right, for the sins of the whole world. And then you have Barabbas who was let go. Just like with Jonah. You have Jonah and you have the lot that falls upon Jonah. And what's going to happen with Jonah? We're going we're to look at it. Go to Jonah chapter number 1. Go back to Jonah chapter number 1. Something else that's interesting is that while Jesus Christ was offered on the cross, when he was sacrificed on the cross... What did the soldiers do? Does anybody remember what the soldiers were doing? The Bible says in Matthew 27, 35, And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture 
did they cast lots. Look there in Jonah chapter number 1, verse number 8. Jonah chapter number 1, verse number 8. The Bible says, Then said they unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us. What is thine occupation, and whence comest thou? And what is thy country, and of, and of what people art thou? And he said unto them, I am an Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. Excuse me. Then were the men exceedingly afraid and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Verse number 11. Then said they unto him, What shall we, excuse me, what shall we do unto thee that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wrought, it says, and was tempestuous. So like we said, you have these heathen men that are on this boat with him. And Jonah's so selfish, Jonah doesn't take the opportunity to go give them the gospel. Or even Jonah knows why all of this had come upon him. And he stood by why the lot was cast and everything. And he just stands by while he's putting these other people in danger and doesn't care at all. He doesn't open his mouth. He waits till that lot falls upon himself. And then they're like, it's you. And then he's got to explain himself. So now he's got himself in a situation here. He's got himself in a situation. He's got himself in a dichotomy. Where he has to, you know, he's basically going to have to fess up and tell them. But notice that Jonah didn't come to them and he didn't tell them what was wrong. Or Jonah didn't go to them and tell them how they could be saved physically. They had to come to him and say, hey, just like Acts 16, what must I do to be saved? Because he was selfish, that's why. Because Jonah was selfish. Look down there again, verse number 12. Verse number 12. And he said unto them, take me up and cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea be calm unto you, for I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. So first we saw Jonah's disobedience. Then we saw Jonah's depression. Then we saw the sea was waving and roaring, right? We saw Jonah's disaster. I'm not good at these alliterations. I forgot to make, point them out. But you guys were getting them, I hope. So you have the, the disobedience. You have the depression. You have the disaster. And now we see Jonah's dichotomy, and he made the right decision. Jonah had the, you know, he was, he was in the case before where he was being selfish. Jonah was being very selfish. Jonah only cared about himself. He didn't care about these heathen men. He didn't care about Nineveh, right? But now Jonah had made the right decision. He was in a dichotomy of two, two decisions that were very different from one another. And he fesses up. He, they, once they pin him down, he fesses up and he tells them what they have to do to be saved. How they can be saved. Look at verse number 13. This is interesting. Nevertheless... The men rode hard to bring it to the land, but they could not, for the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. So you see Jonah telling them what they must do to be saved. And it's very easy, right? Just like spiritual salvation, it's very easy. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But what do they do? Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to land. They worked very hard. Just like all the people that we knock on their door... They let you go entirely through the gospel, explain to them how easy salvation is. But they just completely reject it, and they say, I'm a good enough person. It doesn't matter how hard you work, you're not going to make it. Amen. These are fishermen. These aren't just some novice. These are men that spend their life on the water. If there's anybody who's good and who's able to make it to the other side, it would be these fishermen. But guess what? Nevertheless, it says, the men rode hard to bring it to the land. And then it says this, but they could not. Amen. They weren't good enough. There is no one that's good enough. God requires a sacrifice. God required Jonah in this, in this condition. God required Jonah in this situation. But they said, hey, we're going to do it anyways. And what, look what it says to at the end. It's funny because it says, for the sea wrought. For the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. You know who that is? That's God. That's God working against them. Amen. There's only one way. There's only one way of salvation. Look at the next, the next verse, verse 14. Wherefore, so because they weren't able to, they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, saying, We beg you, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not upon us innocent blood, for thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. So they realized, I'm not good enough. I'm not a, I'm not a good enough, you know, uh, whatever. I'm not a good enough fisherman. I'm not, good, I'm not a good enough person. And what do they do? They call upon the name of the Lord. We beseech thee, O Lord. We beseech thee. Let us not perish for this man's life. Look at verse number 15. 
Verse number 15, it says, So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea. Watch this. And the sea ceased from her raging. When that lot fell upon Jonah, that lot was that Jonah was to be sacrificed. Just like Jesus Christ was the sacrifice. Not only that, something extremely interesting. Verse 14, look at that. So it says, they say, and lay not upon us innocent blood. Was Jonah innocent? Jonah was not innocent. Jonah was disobedient. And not only that, Jonah told these people specifically that he fled from the presence of the Lord. They understood that. So to, to apply this directly to Jonah is kind of confusing, doesn't make much sense. But you, if you apply it to Jesus Christ, it makes perfect sense. If you apply it to the spotless lamb, where the Bible says that he made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Not only that, the Bible says that we have a high, we have a high priest which cannot be touched with, we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. The Bible says that he was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. Jonah was not innocent, but Jesus Christ was innocent. Makes perfect sense when you can see that the parallel with Jonah and with Jesus here. Again, look there again in verse number 16. After the sea ceased from a raging, it says, Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord. And then it says this, and made vows. Now I want you to keep your hand here again. We're going to go back to Mark chapter number 4 where we were earlier. Mark chapter number 4. <clears throat> Mark chapter number 4, look at verse number 38. Again, we'll begin reading there in verse number 38. Mark chapter number 4, verse number 38, and it says, And he was in the hinder part of the ship, remember that was Jesus, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? Just as easily as just calling upon the name of the Lord again. It says in verse 39, And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm, and he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? Now watch this. And they feared exceedingly. Just like over in Jonah, it, said, now it says in verse number 16, Then the, mere, the men feared the Lord exceedingly. If you look there in verse number 41, you keep reading, it says, And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this? Referring to Jesus. That even the wind and the sea obey him. So you have, it's interesting, in the Old Testament, you have the men fearing the Lord exceedingly. As soon as they took Jonah and they tossed Jonah into the sea, and the water just ceased. It was obvious, like, wow, no, there's a God in heaven that's powerful. And then you have Jesus Christ standing upon the ship. You have Jesus Christ, he wakes up and he walks upstairs and he says, peace be still. You know what they did? They feared the Lord exceedingly. They feared Jesus Christ exceedingly because they were able to see that power from Jesus Christ. And he was able to speak and just cause the winds, cause the storm, cause, the, cause it from being tempestuous, from, from working against them. Look back at Jonah chapter number 1, if you kept your place. Jonah chapter number 1, we'll look at verse number 17. Jonah chapter number 1, verse number 17, it says, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish, it says, three days and three nights. Now, obviously, this kind of brings us back to where we started again. Like Matthew chapter number 12, verse number 40, the Bible says, For as Jonas, referring to Jonah, was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so also shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So you see the picture again, the sign of the prophet Jonah. And you can see how, how deep the Bible is. And when the Bible says the sign of the prophet Jonah... It's not only that, that Jonah was in that whale for three days and three nights. It refers to it as, as, as a fish in the Old Testament and then a whale in the New Testament. But there's so much more than that. And in addition to that, you have G Jonah only being there for three days and three nights. Jonah didn't die in that whale. Don't, Jonah didn't rot in that whale. So that jo Jonah being in the whale, and then look at verse number 10 of chapter 2. It says, And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. As we all know, Jonah didn't die in that, in that whale. He resurrected from that whale. So you know, another picture of Jonah is not only of Jesus with Jonah, is not only that Jonah was in the whale's belly, it was specifically that he was there for three days and three nights, not forever. He resurrected from there. You know what is something even more interesting than that? When Jesus Christ resurrected... How long was Jesus on this earth? 
40 days, right? He's here for 40 days and 40 nights. Jonah resurrects from the whale. Verse number 10, he gets down and he goes preaching. You know what he says? Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. 40 days and Nineveh shall, shall be overthrown. So the Bible is so deep. It's so amazing. And you know, what, you know what's, what, what I really love about this story so much? Is that even after Jonah's disobedience, God was willing to use him. So we saw Jonah's disobedience, number one. Because of his disobedience, we saw Jonah's depression. We saw that that's something that will... Being disobedient doesn't bring happiness. It brings depression. Not only that, it brings a disaster. It will bring a, a storm that God will send in your life. God will send trouble in your life. Not only that either, we saw the dichotomy because you have to make a decision. There comes a time where you're going to continue down this path or are you going to make a decision. And we see that Jonah did the right thing. So lastly, my fifth point is that we see the deliverance of Jonah. Not only do you see the deliverance of Jonah himself getting that second opportunity, but you see how Jonah was used to deliver the men on the ship. Jonah was used to go and to preach God's word in Nineveh and to deliver 120,000 men and also much cattle, the Bible says. Not only that either, I think the greatest thing that God used Jonah for, the greatest, the greatest thing that God used Jonah for was, for, I believe strongly, that it was that Jonah was able not only to write the scriptures, but he was also able to be a figure for thousands of years of people reading their Bible of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was able to be a figure of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe that Jonah, you know, I, I like to believe this, that after this point that Jonah was the one that pinned down the book of Jonah, and that hopefully Jonah, you know, because you could still see his disobedient spirit later on in the book of Jonah, but I believe and I hope that Jonah became obedient. But even if he didn't, even if he continued down that same path and had a bad spirit, we can see in chapter number three that Jonah got a second chance. And if you say to yourself, well, how does this apply to me? You know, I'm not going to be, my life is not going to be used to pin down scripture. I'm not going to be a figure of Jesus Christ. I agree, I agree with you and neither am I. But look at Jonah chapter number three, verse number one. I want you to notice this. It says, and the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, <clears throat> that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. Then it says, So Jonah arose, and he went. And if you compare, <clears throat> like I mentioned earlier, Jonah chapter number one there, where the first command goes to Jonah to go preach, and then you compare the second command, they're almost identical. You know, what, you know what that tells me? That God didn't bring up any of the problems and God didn't bring up all of the, all of the, the disobedience that Jonah had done. He punished him for that. And this is a great picture of our salvation as well. That once we're saved, once we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that God separates us from our sins as far as the east is from the west, flat earthers. As far as it could be possibly, right? Exactly. But not only that, to the Christian to the Christian that's been disobedient, to the Christian that got saved and never went to church, God will give you a second chance. God will have a Nineveh for you to go preach to. God will have a bunch of doors that you can go knock and a bunch of people that you could get saved. God will give you that second chance. God is willing to use you. But you have a dichotomy just like Jonah did. You have a dichotomy where you need to make a decision. I want you to look at Jonah chapter number 2. Jonah chapter number 2, we're going to end there. Look at Jonah chapter number 2, verse number 9. It says, but I will sacrifice. This is Jonah speaking from, the, from the, the whale's belly. But I will sacrifice unto thee, he's praying to God, with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. Now, it's real interesting that statement that he makes right there. I will pay that that I have vowed. It's almost like Jonah is now saying to God, I am willing to go to Nineveh. I'm ready to start obeying God. I'm ready to start obeying you. I'm willing. Whatever cup that you have for me, I'm going to drink it. He says, I will pay that that I have vowed. And look at the next verse. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and he vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. God was waiting for him all along just to say, I'm ready to go to Nineveh. I'm ready to go serve you. I'm ready to go. I believe that, that Jonah probably made maybe, maybe just a, a covenant or a vow that, hey, I'm going to preach for you for the rest of my life. Or maybe he specifically made a vow that I'll go to Nineveh someday. 
Maybe I'll specifically go there and preach. But here's the thing. Anything that we could do for God is just our reasonable service. Amen. Jonah was not going above, above and beyond by what he did to go to Nineveh. But Jonah was paying that that he had vowed. And God would give any of us a second chance. So you say, you know, what do I do? You know, if, if I'm in this dichotomy, let's say that I was living a disobedient life, how do I get back into God's graces? How do I get back to where I can serve God? It's very, very simple. Very simple. All you do is pay that that you vowed. Amen. You just need to start serving God again. Amen. God has a Christian race that we are all, we all have our own path. We have things that God wants us to do. What you do is you get back in church if you're not in church. Amen. If you're not going soul winning today, you know what you do? You find out when the next soul winning time is, when you're off work, and you come soul winning Amen. with the church. If you haven't been praying, you know what you do tomorrow? You say, hey, I'm going to start praying every day. If you haven't been reading your Bible, do you know what you should do early tomorrow morning? Pay that that you vowed. Amen. Open up your Bible early in the morning and start reading. God has a Christian race for you to run. You know how, much, how easy it is? All you have to do is just forget the things that are behind you because God will forgive you. God's going to punish you for it, but he'll totally forgive you and he'll come to you and he'll just give you that same command and completely forget about what you did in the past. He'll give you that same command, put you right back in the race, and then you can just start running that race again as a Christian. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I thank you, dear Lord, for all the pictures of our Lord Jesus Christ. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for just, for just how deep your word is, dear Lord, that you could have thousands of men stand up and preach the same passage, and they'll all find something different, they'll all find something new, and it's always just so amazing, and your word is just so great and so powerful. And I thank you, dear Lord, that you're a a God that's merciful and you're a God that's long-suffering and that you give many chances and you give many opportunities, dear Lord. But help us not to take advantage of that, dear Lord. Help us just to pay that that we have vowed. We love you and in Jesus Christ's name, amen.